Today's episode of The Guilty Feminist was recorded on the 10th of December in Melbourne as a celebration of the life of Cal Wilson with some of her closest comedy friends. I hope you enjoy it. At 6pm British time this evening, we will release an episode, uh, just a one-on-one conversation between me and the CEO of Amnesty UK about the worsening humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and Israel. We intend to release another episode with a full panel in January next year. But in the meantime, please listen to and share the episode that we will release later today. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's a laugh along, cry along and sing along. Thank you. to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So this is my feminist Harry McCleary poem. My hope for the future, here's what it includes, to validate women, to educate dudes, to stand up, not shut up, to step up, to say, this feminist bitch is not going away, to be louder and prouder, to take up more space, to meet hate head on and shout love in its face, to not keep my anger in cheerful disguise, to be one of the women, not one of the guys, to check on my privilege and note when it's there, to give up my seat, to give others the chair. If your struggles weren't mine and our thoughts are at variance, I vow that I'll bow to your lived experience. I celebrate feminists in all of our finery, the women, the girls, the people not binary, because we stand up, not shut up, we step up, we shout. We're feminists, dudes, and we're sorting it out. Welcome to the Guilty Feminist Celebration of Cal Wilson. Please welcome to the stage your host, Deborah Francis-White. So I've brought extra tissues. Um, Okay, so I've written something just to begin. Um, I am... No, I I won't step on it. I'm just going to say it. Um, What to say about my sister in arms, Cal Wilson? It will take a long time to accept that she's really not here anymore. I have to say, although I did an inordinate amount of crying in London, I only got to Melbourne last night... And it wasn't really real till I saw her close friends backstage. So I might be more emotional than is acceptable on stage. And I'm okay with it. If you are. Um, It's normal to cry. Cal and I sometimes cried on stage with our guests. And she'd be fine with it. She was good with emotions. So permission to all of us to laugh, cry, sing and let it all out. This is an Irish wake, not a British memorial. (laughs) I've never met a human being who was more alive. Uh, So many people got in touch after she passed away to say that they discovered her work through the Guilty Feminists, mostly people from the UK or North America. She was so successful here. Other people got in touch to say they always looked forward to her episodes or got excited um, to see that she was on the show. It's been one of my life's greatest honours to shine a light on Cal, to anyone who didn't already know her work, and for our show to bask in her glorious light. The first official Australian Guilty Feminist was here on this stage at the Wheeler Centre. Cal was the guest, and to this day, if someone asks me for the best episode of the Guilty Feminist or a good place to start, I say that one. It was called Nice Girls Don't. And in it, Cal told us a story about boys at her high school hazing her in a violent way that felt frightening, with such vulnerability and power that we all cried, and also an embarrassing vomiting on a romantic date story that had us all in stitches. (laughs) Moments later, she could change a gear like no one else. After that, she became my constant collaborator and co-pilot in Australia and New Zealand, and I adored the way she always loved to do the show, Because of some COVID admins, she had to miss some of the dates of the last tour and she was gutted. She made us feel so loved and so important. Her I'm a Feminist butts were legendary. 
No one could confess a hypocrisy like Cal. Her stories of telling cold callers, I'm sorry, I can't buy anything from you. My husband is the decision maker. <laughs> were particularly memorable. She told us she also gave Chris permission to say the same thing when he picked up the phone. She would write powerful, hilarious, bespoke pieces, memorably her feminist take on the little red hen, often only hours before the show, and blow the roof off the place. How did she know what was funny? She never tested it in front of anyone. She just knew. She always knew what was funny. And more than that, she made me funnier. She made me relax on stage, feel safe and talented. I promise I'm not just saying this. I said it many times when she was with us. No one made me better on stage than Cal. I'm less good because she's gone and will strive forever to be as good as she made me feel. Her golden, easy generosity was always there. Many comedians do try to be generous, but are secretly annoyed and competitive if someone else gets to the punchline first <laughs> or has a topper that gets a bigger laugh. Cal relished our laughs as much as her own. She was like a graceful dance partner on stage, every punchline a pirouette. She had a deep, real love of the craft of comedy and funny bones that believed in the power of joy. Her turns of phrase, the rhythms of her voice. She was also a real feminist, not just someone who said the right things, someone who cared about other women, bigged them up, introduced them, looked after them, said nice things about you when you weren't there. She cared about injustice, was angered by it. She listened to our guests. She was physically intelligent and thoughtful. She had a well of empathy. She loved being a mother. I know everyone loves their kids, but also they often complain about them and enjoy their time away from them. Not Cal. Cal didn't just love Digby. She admired his wit, his whimsy, his athleticism, smarts and heart. She loved spending time with him and always rushed home after gigs and tours to be with him and Chris. She loved their nest, their cats. She and I talked a lot about aging. Cal and I are feminists, but we used to complain about it secretly. How our faces and bodies were changing, the way the industry treats women who dare to leave the house past the age of 27. <laughs> Today is my birthday. I wouldn't normally mention it because I don't want rumors going around that I have birthdays. <laughs> But this year, it feels like a privilege to age. We focused on the downsides, but now I'm angry that we will never get to be old ladies together. I already miss knowing Cal as a wonderful, purple-haired, increasingly eccentric icon, an outrageous, defiant, elderly woman that she deserved to be. The only way I can begin to reconcile it is that she lived wholly and fully that she lived and loved more than most people live in two lifetimes. And she was loved by so many people. She meant so much to so many. She touched more lives than most people would in nine lifetimes. Maybe that's why she was such a cat person. <laughs> Today, the shop that was meant to print my banners that you can see on stage couldn't do it at the last minute. So I had to ring Officeworks and explain I needed a rush job on a Sunday. At first, everyone said they couldn't do it. But when I explained what they were for, Patrick at office work said, well, not normally, but for Cal Wilson, we'll make it happen. <laughs> Shout out to Patrick at office works on Burke Street. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much she was loved. So tonight will be challenging and sad, and wonderful, and celebratory. And for Cal, we'll make it happen. Fuck boy, oh, I love you, Cal, and tonight is for you. Tonight is for you. Thank you so much all for coming out. The ticket sold in like an hour, and then we released some more that we'd held back, and they then sold in an hour, and I really, really appreciate you all coming out to be with us tonight. Um, thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, music was very important to Cal, and our first guest is an artist who Cal adored. An Australian artist, Cal didn't know she just loved her music, and 
when she heard that, she agreed to come here tonight and perform. Because for Cal, we'll make it happen. Please welcome to the stage our first performer of the evening, the incredible Dallas Sprashka. Cal would have liked me to have done that tonight. So I'm going to attempt some live vocal loops. Are you with me on that yeah. one? Should I do that? All right. Just get this naughty little string in tune and we'll be good. with 
me? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll, I'll be here when you wake right by your side. I got time to wait. Come back to me, find your way. I'll, I'll be here when you wake right by your side. I got time to wait. Come back to me. Can we ever get resurrect our love? Did you forget our melody? Yeah, the sugar is so sweet. Oh, friend, can I tell you that I miss the way you say that it's gonna be okay? Yeah, it's gonna be okay. I'll, I'll be here when you wait. Remember your side. To the bottom, yeah, the bottom of the sea. It was you who rescued me, got me on the feet. I thought there was nothing that could ever divide us. Now there's something in the way. Tell me it's gonna be okay.
Dallas Press, Thank for everybody. You. Thank you so much, Dallas. That was really, really wonderful. Um, and now, please welcome my co-pilot for this evening, somebody that Cal introduced me to and was very, very special to Cal, the incredible Kirsty Wiebeck. Uh, thank you so much, Deborah, for having me co-pilot today. Um, yeah, and thanks, Dallas, as well. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I thought I'd cried all my tears, but I don't. <laughs> I don't think that will ever be possible. Um, yeah, Cal was. Um, yeah, she was my best mate um, for millions of reasons. Um, I met her many, many years ago. Not that many, actually. She was in the industry for a very long time, so I guess I was a relative newcomer to her life, but I met her about 10 years ago, and um, I met her at the biggest gig that I'd been invited to um, at that point in my career, and um, it wasn't a career. Uh, it was a very generous offering that they allowed me to be on the bill at uh, this event, and I remember rocking up and it was a real who's who of Australian comedy, um, all the heavyweights. Uh, it was the um, Midsummer Carnival Lesbian Comedy Gala. And uh, I rocked up and, and I remember going, oh, oh, yes, she's one of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I found out swiftly that she was uh, just an ally, um, but... <laughs> I allowed it. Um, <laughs> you got to let an occasional ally slip through the cracks. <laughs> um, she was so kind to me. She was so kind to me. I remember leaving the event that night and she'd just been so generous and kind and I had a five-minute set. I had two punchlines in five minutes and regardless of whether or not you know anything about stand-up comedy, that's not enough punchlines. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Not even nearly enough. <laughs> but she was so kind to me and she agreed to come a few months later to do my comedy room that I had uh, set up in order to meet more comedians. Um, she was one of the first people to support it and not long after that we became fast friends and um, something about Cal that everyone has said since her passing is that she was just incredible at bringing people together. Like... Deb just mentioned them, like she introduced Deb and I because uh, she knows I only like Sagittarians. Um, <laughs> and it's Deb's birthday today and <laughs> it's my birthday tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and I am currently wearing the only bright item of clothing that I own and it will be no surprise to any of you in this room that this was a gift for my birthday last year from Cal. It has my own cat and my dog on it. Um, <laughs> and I was telling Deb a little bit earlier in the green room about how Cal harassed me last December. And harassed is the only way to describe it. Um, I was very busy and stressed and she kept messaging me going, can I please have a picture of your dog and your cat? <laughs> and I kept sending her pictures of my dog and my cat and then three hours later she'd get back to me and they weren't adequate pictures <laughs> of my dog and my cat. And I remember after sending her four rounds of these pictures, coming home one night after a gig and saying to my partner, Cal is harassing me for photos of Joan and Fergie. And I said, the bit that's annoying me the most is that I know she'll be doing something kind with them. LAUGHTER and she was. Uh, she also got my partner a matching one, um, just because she'd look adorable in it, is what she said. Um, I was livid because it wasn't Elle's birthday, it was mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Cal was a very, very, very dear friend of mine. Um, over the years of our friendship, um, we only ever had one disagreement. Um, it was quite a big one. We didn't have time for any other disagreements, actually, because we just kept circling back to this one. And the crux of our disagreement was that I believe that one time when I was camping down in the Otways, I saw a panther. <laughs> <laughs> and Cal believed 
that one time when I was camping down in the Otways, I didn't see a panther. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when I told her the story one day over coffee, I remember distinctly she said to me, Weebeck, I will always defend your right to believe that you saw a panther <laughs> in the Otways, but I just simply don't believe that you did. And that set off years of her sending me photos of bin bags on the side of the road. <laughs> Weebeck, is this your panther? <laughs> Discarded black track pants on the beach, found your panther, Weebeck. She was just the best and it's a great honour to be here today to um, yeah, pay tribute to Cal again uh, with some of our great mates. So thank you all so much for being here as well. Kirsty Weebeck, everybody. Um, thank you, Kirsty. That was lovely and funnier than mine. Um, <laughs> Which Cal would have been generous about, but I'm sort of... I'm not, I'm not irritated by it, per se. I, I, in fact, I think it was a good... It's been a good build, I think, so far. Okay. We've had some... <laughs> I'm getting the subtext. I won't make any more jokes. No! <laughs> no, I said, please do. I'm, I'm, jo I'm, I'm joking. It's only because I, I said know, that about comedian speaker. No, 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 no. no. We've, we've started with some rawness, and then we've gone into some fabulous music, and now we've had some great uh, comedy memories of Cal... Um, we, we usually start the show by saying I'm a feminist butt, um, but tonight we thought that Kirsty and I would just uh, each say one of our favourite of Cal's I'm a feminist butts. So my favourite Cal's I'm a feminist butt is, uh, is one time she said, she declared this very, very proudly. She was like, I'm a feminist, but uh, my side quest is to find the perfect clothes peg. <laughs> And this sparked off, I am not kidding, this enormous response from the Guilty Feminist audiences. So almost wherever Cal went, someone would come up and say, this is the perfect peg, and I've brought it for you. <laughs> People sent her pegs, clothing, peg companies were like, please try ours. Um, I said to her, you could make a very lucrative deal with someone at the moment for the right, you know, the right clothes peg. Um, and tonight, Chris, her husband, came backstage and said, this is... The perfect peg, according to Cal, she completed that side quest, and it's metal and apparently as colourful like Cal. It's got all these colours of the rainbow, and apparently it doesn't get hot on the washing line, which I can see as an advantage in Australia, but I'm from London, <laughs> where the idea of putting your wet washing outside is laughable. <laughs> it was the last place you'd put it. You hang it over a radiator, so you don't really need a peg. But if you did peg it out on a, it would never. The peg would never get hot. Um, but this peg is going to come on every guilty feminist tour of Australia and New Zealand from now on. Um, it's always going to be with us, and I'm going to take it out on stage every night. Um, so Cal's Cal will always be with us. Um, but it, tonight there's a Christmas tree out the back, and some of you will have already done it. But if you haven't, there are pegs. Um, there's also coloured paper, pens, jewels, all, all the colours of Cal. And if you could leave a memory on the Cal Christmas tree, we would absolutely love that. But you've got to peg it on. That's, that's key. Um, Kirsty, have you got an I'm a Feminist butt? I do. Just, I just want to quickly say as well, Deb hasn't let me touch the peg. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, yeah, but please. <laughs> oh, God, okay, thank you. It was a hint, so thank you. Okay, I just want to say it is very robust. <laughs> <laughs> it's as robust as you'll imagine. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Deb. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> my uh, well, one of my favourite um, of Cal's "I'm a feminist," but was um, that she didn't want to go on "I'm a celebrity" because they don't let you wear concealer. <laughs> And I believe she made a joke about um, how she didn't want to sit in a bucket of snakes looking like a panda. That's right. I remember this one. I remember this one well because I didn't know that. And I said, surely they let you. She said, no, no makeup. And I was like, that's, that's too much. Like making everyone laugh at you while you eat grubs and you're not allowed eyeliner. I think Amnesty International need to get onto that because that feels, that feels like cruel and unusual punishment. It's I remember that. But then... The turn of that story is, because when I was listening to old episodes of Cows and we made a best of episode, I heard that and I went, 
hold on a minute, Cal did do I'm a Celebrity after that. She did. What changed her mind? Did she work out how to sneak concealer into her bra? <laughs> she found out she had an allergy to concealer. Um, no, she didn't. She didn't. <laughs> she didn't. Um, she... I remember when she talked about it on The Guilty Feminist, she yeah. said that um, she made a joke about how she did it uh, during um, the pandemic, like when we were in, in lockdown town, and um, it was more like, I'm a celebrity, get me anywhere. <laughs> but talking to her about it, like, she, she hadn't wanted to do it for years, and then she, it just felt like the right time. Like, she changed her mind, essentially, is, you know, is what she told us anyway in the group chat. Um, <laughs> She changed her mind and and the cool thing about that for Cal was that, I mean, she was always open to so many experiences, which was the best. Um, she always had so many cool stories and it's because she was a real yes and person. Mm. And um, something that came out of that experience for her was, as usual, remarkable friendships with wonderful people. So... Uh, she mentioned on The Guilty Feminist, and it was certainly the truth, that one of uh, the dearest things that she got out of that experience was her friendship with Poe. Um, uh, some of you will know her as a celebrity chef here in Australia. She's an absolute gem. She's one of the best people. And, um, you know, a, a lot of us were fortunate enough that Cal also brought Poe into our lives as well. Um, but, yeah, that, as usual, like, and you probably know this as well, Deb, like, whenever she talked about anything, it often circled back to the people that she met along the way. Mm. And she just had such a passion for meeting people and forging these friendships and she had all the time in the world for people. So it turned out so great that she did I'm a Celebrity. She told me she really enjoyed it and I cannot imagine enjoying it. I just It's just my <laughs> idea of absolute hell. And she was like, I, when I was there, she said, actually, I really, really loved it. And yeah. I was glad that she really loved it. I'm glad that she went for everything that she wanted to do. Yeah. She, she, you know, she really, really lived. Um, and how did how did you... Because we didn't get to see that, of course, because I was in the UK where it wasn't aired. How did she go on it? Was there lots of bug eating? She ate some stuff. <laughs> she definitely ate some stuff. Like, um, I remember she did some stand-up bits about, like, it seemed um, really uh, genital heavy. Oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they love that on that show. Mm. I, don't, I guess it's, they're like, oh, what's the grossest thing we could make someone eat? Or, oh, mm. it'll have to be the bulls. I don't know. Like, but it seemed like a lot of that, like, oh, uh, like, uh, he's a sheep nut, you know? <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I I mean, it's not for me. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, they'd have to get rid of, like, all of the genitals and mm. the spiders for me Listen, to ever consider. Listen, I'm glad it. she did it, but Cal could see the funny and the joyful side of anything. Yeah. I can't. I'm, uh, I'll be like, Cal, no. And she just, she would always find, like... It, like we could be I remember one time our plane it, our plane was cancelled and it looked like we were going to have to drive from the South Island to the North Island of New Zealand and then we still wouldn't make the show and Cal could make that fun do you know what I mean like a lot yeah. of people would just be like oh fuck and I'm so tired you know when you're on tour you're tired you're eating pizza backstage and then you're having breakfast at airports and you're getting up at insane o'clock and she always managed to make everything fun so I I can imagine that if I <sighs> I, would, I can't say I would ever enjoy eating the testicle of a wallaby, but if I could imagine enjoying it, it would only be with Cal. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon she'd put, like, a silly voice to it or something. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no, don't hate me. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's time to get our guests out. Um, and these are um, some very close friends of Cal um, who knew her... As a comedian and knew her as a friend and a wonderful person, would you like to introduce them? Yeah, sure. Um, all right, first up, uh, Claire Hooper, the wonderful Claire Hooper. <laughs> all right, and keep that going for the legendary Geraldine Hickey. <laughs> and the irreplaceable Susie Yusuf. Um, you know, um, you know that comedic build you were talking about? It yeah. ends now. <laughs> <laughs> We've just been staring at each other backstage like zombies. We've got... Mm. It's, it's a, it's a funny lie. one. Don't lie. Actually, no, we did also have a bit of fun. Yeah. In amongst their looking like zombies. All right. Well, I wasn't going to talk about that. Oh, I may as well. Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> 
There's, they've got um, trolleys out the back that you put the chairs on, which is um, perfectly sized to sit on and have someone push you around. <laughs> and it, it wasn't us that did it, but we saw some other people do it. Yeah. Can I um, can I say the I'm a celebrity? I um, I watch Cal eat so many things, and it looked painful every time. Like I mean, you say that she would have enjoyed it and had fun with it. Um, I didn't look like it. It looked really <laughs> awful. Yeah, I, I, I think Bake Off was a good move, like of things to put in your mouth. Oh my Do you know god, what I mean? she deserves Bake Off. She deserves. Yeah. Ba- she really, really deserves. And I heard yesterday in the writers' room I was in in Sydney that she got nominated for an actor for Bake Off. Yes, and for Who the Bloody Hell Are We? Another uh, project she did this year. So, yeah, yeah, I it's mean, been a strange, I know, bittersweet weekend for all the. Accolades, the announcements yeah. of nominations. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it has been. It has been because, of course, you know, she deserves to be honoured and we want her to be honoured, but also be nice if she could be on the red carpet. Yeah. It was one of those um, moments where, you know, you like you carry on with your life and you're like, oh, la, 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 la. I've, I've finished all the... Cro-. And you read, they go, ah! I, oh, there's still tears left. And, you know, cause it, but it was really nice and, and beautiful, but it's... Um, yeah. It's, it's Does not. anyone else get angry about how life goes on? Yes. I get yes. really pissed off about it. I'm just like, what? Like, how is it still going on? And I, you know, and with big horrifying tragedies in the world as mm. well going on at the moment, you just go, how are we still just like, but you still have to have a sandwich. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, yeah. after I got the news about Carla, I was just like, like, you do have to like still send an email and make a sandwich. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I had a day or so, but then you're like, Things ha- you have to have a shower. Do you know what I mean? And it just seems insulting. Yeah. Does anyone else feel that about grief? That it seems insulting that things yeah. go on. And people always say, like, you know, when I die, I want you to just go on as normal, and you know, I want you to be. And you know, I'm like, I don't. I I want things to stop. Yeah. At least a fortnight a morning. Yeah. At least a fortnight. Even then, after that, I'm just like. <laughs> and people say, oh, I don't want anyone to cry at my funeral. I want it to be a celebration. Of- no, I want tears. I want. People to be really upset. Yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. I just every time I'm at a funeral and someone says, "Oh, do you want a sandwich?" I just think this is wrong. Like, yes, I will have one, but no, <laughs> I don't want any yeah. sandwiches at my funeral. Yeah, I don't I'm, want I'm, sandwiches. I want people to be too yeah. upset to eat. Yeah, but but right now I'm actually starving, and that egg and lettuce looks great. Yeah. It's just um, annoying that things go on. I just find it. I don't know. I find it very just. I um, stopped recycling. <laughs> That's is what that's, that's what Cal would have wanted, yeah. Jess. <laughs> is, is that the way you grieve to stop? No, I don't, like I didn't really, but I I thought I thought, well, what's the fucking yeah. point? Like, yeah, like, I um killed a seal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we we did see a seal though recently. That was fun. Yeah, we did yeah. see a seal. Did you or was it a garbage by, um, bag? <laughs> what's that? Did you or was it a garbage bag? <laughs> <laughs> no, we got up close enough. But we, uh, Kirsty, oh, you know, we grieved by um, going and shredding, um, like went boogie boarding. Yeah, like two massive lesbians in grief. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, how do we process our, our feelings? Oh, let's go bodyboarding. <laughs> Can't talk under the waves, but you yeah. can cry. Um, it's like the ocean crying, though, isn't it? Really, it's like it's like you're the ocean's tears when you're yeah. bodyboarding. It's very yeah. cleansing. It's good. Yeah. I, f- I felt pretty furious at Cal's funeral because we shared the love slash obsession of concealer, mm. and I felt pretty angry that she got away with wearing concealer that day and I did not because of the tears. Mm. And one of the last messages I have from her um, was a continued discussion about our obsession with concealer. And she said, check your bag. And I had three of the same concealer in my handbag, which I felt wow. very guilty about. Um, but I just remember that day looking at one point uh, at a photo of you and I, Claire Hooper, and being like, how the fuck does Hoops get away with looking like that at Cal's funeral? And I looked disgusting because you looked amazing. Um, <laughs> you did. I'm a feminist, but that's the best thing anyone said this episode. <laughs> I felt guilty that we took a photo at Cal's funeral, but you had these beautiful decorations that you'd made for the actual... Now I'm going to get upset about that. Um, you'd made these beautiful decorations. It was such a Cal funeral, so bright and colourful. And I thought, gosh, I'm being a vain asshole about this concealer. And I messaged my partner and he was like, just 
put on concealer then. <laughs> yeah, if anything's in Cal's honour, it's putting on concealer. Yeah. yeah. But I'm... that was a reason why I, when she, when she said um, about, uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, not wanting to do it because of concealer, we bonded over that. And I said I would never do it um, because I don't want to wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> But also, they haven't asked me, so I don't have to worry about that. Can I, can I just say, this is one of the loveliest things Cal ever did for my family. And it was when I'm a Celebrity had just aired. And it was my, bo- my daughter's eighth birthday party. And I, the thing is, when you have kids at a school, the, the other kids, your kids' friends, they don't know that you have an extensive television CV and quite a reputation in the industry. <laughs> Yeah, like, they just think you're your kid's mum, right? They don't care at all. And I was like, Cal, could you please help me impress my daughter's friends? So we had an eighth birthday party called I'm a Penelope, get me out of here. And um, Cal, they didn't let her take the, the boots or the shorts or anything when she finished the show. So she had to go to Kmart and purchase all of the items for the costume. Wow. She made two jungle crowns and she... Um, she hid behind my garden shed in over 30 degree heat <laughs> for the perfect point where I was like, and we have a special guest. And the kids finally gave a shit about me. Uh. <laughs> they were like, you know the lady from I'm a celebrity. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually a big deal. And then Cal ran this birthday party for all these eight-year-old kids. Amazing. On a, on a week. And, I mean, she has her own kid that she could have been with. But no... Yeah, she's just yeah. present tense by accident again. She was so generous. Like if something sounded fun and like it would bring other people joy, she was like, yeah, all right, I'll do it. Yeah, that is, that is true. Um, we thought we'd do some guilty memories and some feminist memories um, of Cal. Um, does anyone have a guilty memory of Cal? Uh, yes, I do. I, I, I would like to read it if that's okay. Yes, I'd love you to. Um, I didn't live in the same city as Cal, so when we hung out, it was because we had to deliberately make the time to see each other, which is pretty much the most kind thing you can do as an adult friend. Much of our friendship was built on stealing away moments to catch up, a coffee in Sydney or a lunch in Melbourne, usually with Claire Hooper, preferably with Claire Hooper, Um, or backstage at a gig or through birthday voice messages or videos, um, usually with elaborate puppets from Cal, uh, or late-night phone calls. Um, We often sent each other photos of ourselves about to fall asleep without concealer on. (laughs) After text conversations that mostly consisted of us rhyming with each other's messages or changing lyrics to songs for hours. (laughs) And in our last message, we had the concealer discussion, but I'll go back over that. Um, uh, Cal ended most of her messages by saying, how I adore you. And not to show off, but that's like hundreds of messages that I have with just telling her telling me how much she loved me or how her heart felt better after a catch-up or how she couldn't wait to see my masculine hands again. <laughs> my messages were exactly the same, always with declarations of love for another. It's very clear to me and all of her friends that it was just who Cal was. It's not just me who has hundreds of those messages. When she loved you, she told you, not once but all the time. Her generosity knew no bounds. She somehow had more love and more time than anyone else. For the record, I don't have masculine hands. (laughs) (laughs) And either does Cal, but in 2016, we spent a lot of time listening to Yacht Rock. We'd both been... (laughs) We'd both been cast in Whose Line Is It Anyway, the Australian edition, which if you blinked, you would have missed that. Um, (laughs) um, Part of the pre-production boot camp was learning a whole range of different song genres for the finale of the show, which was always an improvised song. In one of our jams, we changed the lyrics of the Doobie Brothers song, What a Fool Believes, from She Had a Place in His Life to She Had a Masculine Hand. (laughs) And it tickled us both a lot. Too much, probably. We thought it was hysterical. We rarely messaged or chatted without mentioning each other's masculine hands. <laughs> when I saw Cal in hospital the day before she died, I held her hand and I wanted to tell her again how much I loved her and how loved she was by everyone, but I looked down at her hands and I paused. 
I turned to the nurse, the only other person in the room at the time, and said through my tears, her hands look particularly masculine today. (laughs) And Cal would have really loved that. It was a long-running joke between us and I hate that my brain's fixated on it now. And the nurse, who was undoubtedly confused, (laughs) generously offered, tell her about her masculine hands. She can hear you. I started crying and between tears I told her how much I loved her masculine hand and the other one. And part of me hates that one of my last interactions with her, I was thinking about that joke. And I didn't want that to be what I spoke about today because she deserves better than this. And what even is masculine and gender is a construct and and Cal is more than her hands and I don't want to talk about things that I hate when I'm paying tribute to someone who I love so much. But I do hate that she's gone. And I hate that I'm talking about her in the past tense and that I'll never get to listen to Yacht Rock without feelings of immense sadness, although I think some people do. (laughs) (laughs) But Cal loved jokes. She loved them. She would jump on any and every opportunity to joke, to extend the joke, to subvert the joke. and She would always improve the joke. She loved to play. And she had no idea how next level brilliant she was During Whose Line, rest in peace, Whose Line, (laughs) we worked with a live band led by Kit Warhurst and they were brilliant. I remember Cal whispering to me, they're so cool, what are they doing here with us? (laughs) It was the first time I had worked with Cal and I confided later that night that I was, when I was sitting with Bridie Connell, another beautiful New Zealander who was also in the show, that I had the same thought about Cal Wilson. She's so cool, what on earth am I doing here with the likes of her? I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Cissy. That's the thing. Thank you. I understand that um, that that feeling of you know what yeah how did you're so cool why did I get to be your friend type thing um, I uh, hoops knee back and I, I so I will <laughs> cow Kurt I'll, I'll reference <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So many things going on in my head. Um, You fell over and smashed your knee one day. Yeah. And Cal called you knee back. Yeah. I put it in the group chat. Um, It was earlier this year. I put it in the group chat with Jez and Hoops and Cal that, yeah, I tripped on a tram track and recovered (laughs) and then tripped on the next tram track while recovering. (laughs) And And the second one brought me down <laughs> and it brought me down in a big way um i was walking my dog i was meant to be on my way to the airport to to go to sydney to do a gig and i was suddenly on the phone to triple o um slipping in and out of consciousness and um i i had to go to hospital in an ambulance and i had to get my knee stitched up so i was reporting live to the group chat yeah. from the back of the ambulance you'll never believe what's happened everyone <laughs> they believed it <laughs> and all I remember from it is Cal called you knee back. <laughs> and I thought that, and I've, that's, I can't call you anything else now. <laughs> um, but it was, it was that group chat is like, it, I, it, yeah, it started years ago. Um, Cal messaged me and it was like the lead up to, you know, comedy festival and it was like, we're all doing shows. And she's like, we just thought, oh, you know, do you want to come, um, you know, join our little crew? And we're just, you know, workshopping ideas and, you know, just talking about, you know, jokes and stuff like that. And then it, I don't know how many years that stuck around for. And obviously we did share jokes and stuff. Um, But I remember that first year, do you remember, and this is the other... Thing that's kind of weird, and get, you know how um, when when people pass away, and you kind of hold on to these little, you kind of make something special, and it's like so silly, but also anyway, there was there, there was that joke um, where she found the blackbird under the bed, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was just because the cat had brought it in, yeah, and we were just trying to work it out, like what's the joke there? Because oh yeah, it was because it was moving. It was like this black bird. Yeah. It was just the wing and yeah. it was flapping when she looked under the bed. Yeah. But it was flapping because it was maggots. <laughs> and oh! <laughs> oh Which is weirdly the most sinister outcome. Yeah. <laughs> so it was 
dead. The poor bird wasn't well, alive. Well, it was just the wing, so yeah, yeah. It was yeah just, the, cat, okay. the cat had brought it in. Just brought the wing in. The, uh, um, so the bird had died. Is or it, just lost a wing. Yeah. But I, I assume it died. Sounds like the bird died. <laughs> it ended up infested with maggots and then the cat found the wing and brought it in. Just so that I just yeah. don't feel that this is I a sad the, story. I reckon the I mean, cat, it is, but... like, brought, there was just a wing under the bed and then it was in maggot. Mag- yeah. And then, yeah. But some, was I, a... it was some sort of thing where... I kind of like to think that maybe the maggots grew a wing. <laughs> uh, that is cool. Yeah. That's cool. You should have been in our chat room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because the I'm only sure suggestion I think I came up was like, what, you know, just imagine it singing, blackbird singing in the dead of night. <laughs> like, and it was just like this, you know, cow singing, blackbird singing in the dead of night. And then every time I'd see a black, like I had a cow singing, that blackbird singing in the dead of night. And um, a couple of weeks I got home and there was um, a nest in our laundry with um, blackbird eggs in there, and I was like, "Oh, it's cow going <laughs> blackbird singing in the dead of night." Little baby chicks. <laughs> anyway, that's my guilty <laughs> memory of cow. I Got have one. Ones. Go on. <laughs> I a, a few years ago, um, I I had a hysterectomy, and um, l- like it was planned. It was in the hospital and stuff. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? I couldn't imagine it was on a group home. Was, oh, you might have thought it was on a tram track. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking my dog. And <laughs> I'd been in recovery for two weeks and I was feeling quite well. And Cal and I used to often take walks together. And we'd alternate. I'd go over to her house one week and the next week she'd come down to my place. And we'd go for a walk and we'd end up at a cafe. And uh, so, so I'd had this operation two weeks earlier, my major surgery, if you will. Um, they, they just took it, right? They just they remove it. Uh, you're left without it. And um, <laughs> I didn't want it, but just so you understand, <laughs> uh, <laughs> major recovery operation. And I, so I go to Cal's and Cal's very aware of the surgery. And, and so we go for this walk. The regular walk that we do is about six and a half kilometre walk up to the cafe back and we got to the cafe and I was um, like close to blacking out. It was a hot day. Cal had set off at this clipping pace and it had just completely left her mind that I just had major surgery. And for some reason, like she was a very close friend of mine and it never occurred to me to say, hey, Cal. I've just had major surgery. Yeah. I trotted along behind her for six and a half kilometres. We get to the cafe. I'm dripping in sweat and just I'm sitting on the seat and Cal goes, you just had a hysterectomy. <laughs> I've just made you jog. I've made you jog for six and a half kilometres. And then she just panicked. And um, she was threatening to get her husband to come and pick us up. <laughs> she was like, he's got to come and get you. Look at the state of you. And uh, we argued over a brunch about what we were going to do to get me home. And I was like, I think what we can do is, one, take the shortcut. And, two, we could go less than 15 k's an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so we took the four-kilometre route home and we did it in about the same time that we did the six and a half k. <laughs> <So, laughs> But she never forgot it and she'd bring it up all the time and every now and then she'd message me and she'd tell me that she was unwell or something and I'd be like, all right, I'm coming over. I've got the hiking boots. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to whisk you off to Mount Kosciuszko. We'll just do a quick hike. <laughs> I just wanted to get my revenge, you know. <laughs> Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Jessica Regan here. And I think it's high time we announced some Guilty Feminist Big Speeches Winter Workshops. If you, like the majority of the population, have a fear of public speaking, or if you quite enjoy it actually, but you'd like to level up your skills, perhaps you know someone who could benefit from this training and this would make a great Christmas present, or maybe you're just curious and would like to give it a go. If you are any of these things, then please go to guiltyfeminist.com forward slash big speeches to secure a place now on one of our winter workshops. 
They are taking place on December 11th at 11 a.m., January the 14th at 3 p.m., January 28th at 11 a.m., and our last one will be February 11th at 3 p.m. Book now to avoid disappointment. Our prices have never been lower. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. We've got some new live shows coming in 2024. Tickets are on sale now for shows at King's Place in London on the 15th of January and 19th of February. Full lineups to be announced, but you know we always get the best co-hosts and the most interesting guests. And we'll be announcing our Australian and New Zealand dates very soon. So keep an eye on the website, guiltyfeminist.com. And if you're enjoying this episode, why not pop over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen and give us a five-star review and a few lovely words. It really does help other people find the podcast. And so does talking about it on social media or even mentioning it to a friend with your face. You can also get ad-free episodes by subscribing on Patreon, Apple Podcasts, or Acast Plus. That's all from me here. Back to the podcast. Geraldine Hickey, you look very beautiful today. Thank you. Is it my jacket? It is your jacket. Do you, so, oh, yeah, this is, yeah, thank you. Lucky you brought it up, Susie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a seamless <laughs> setup. I don't think anyone would have noticed that that was a setup. Thank you. So, Geraldine did say to me just before we went on, Say something about my jacket. Yeah, somebody asked me about my jacket. Um, so I bought this. So for the cow's memorial and her and her funeral, um, she wanted us to wear bright clothes and and stuff. And I I found this in an op shop, and I thought, oh, this is so cow. Like it's I don't know. It was the big buttons and a big collar, and I was just like, I love this. I'll, I'll get it. And then um, I wanted to um, zhuzh it up a bit. I got the puffer paint, and I had two like weird cats that had smudged in puffer paint on the collars. <laughs> and that was it. And I was just in tears, just going, it looks so shit. And I'm like... <laughs> and I thought, I'll take it with me anyway, because maybe someone else might want it. And... Um... <laughs> it was a generous offer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I've washed, I've washed the, the weird cats off. Like, I peeled the puff and paint cats off. They were gone. Um, but I was just like, I don't, I don't know, it just felt like it was a, a nice jacket and Kirsty's partner, Elle, was there and I was just chatting to and I'm like, do you want this? And she was like, y- yes, are you, like, are you sure? And She's I was, so polite, Elle yeah. is so polite. <laughs> I know. She I, was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, well, tell her no, Elle, <laughs> tell her no. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell whether, like, I knew she didn't want to take it, but... <laughs> But Jet but Je- like, took advantage of her kindness. Yeah. <laughs> I got the vibe that she didn't want to take it, but I couldn't tell whether she didn't want to take it because she thought I was being too generous or <laughs> because she thought I was, like, she just didn't was never going to wear it. Um, but I was like, it's from an op shop, it's fine. Like, y- you know, so she took it. And then what was it, like, two weeks later, you rock up and... And you handed it over. She goes, I got it back. Thanks, Elle. Um, but I told her about my failed attempts to zhuzh it up and she's zhuzhed it up. And so it turns out you're, she's a very good in, at doing embroidery. Yeah, she's good. And so why, like, she'd asked me about my favourite birds um, and I was like, oh, how do you name just one? So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the most boring conversation I've ever witnessed. <laughs> I love birds as well. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like, okay, so, oh, well, um, so I've got, well, there's different reasons for the, but I've got the, um, on, oh, so on the college, I've got the Eastern Whitbird um, because it's, it's just got the coolest sound. Um, does anyone know about the Whitbird? Yeah. <laughs> it's the one that goes like that. Um, yeah, like a whip. Um <laughs> The clue was right there in the title the yeah. whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and they're n- notoriously hard to take um, photos of because they, they like to hang out in, like, in the shrubs like, and, and like in the thicket kind of oh thing. Oh, my God. So. How did she get it to sit still enough for an embroidery then? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. She's really good. <laughs> but um, I've, I've gotten a couple of good photos of one, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> and then, um, and then on, on the back... I've got the um, a red tail black cockatoo. Yeah, too. down on that side. Oh, no, that's... Oh, no, up top, up top. Up top, but red tail black cockatoo, because um, that's just a cool bird because they're, like, um, 
they hang out in gangs like teenagers on a train, <laughs> dropping shit everywhere. And then, um, and then on the oh, there, I've got the um, the black shouldered kite because um, they just look really cool. They've got cool red eye. Anyway, so she did all that, but also it's really nice. And she put um, a GH for Geraldine Hickey on the collar. And then if you lift it up though, underneath there's a there's a love heart there, and in the love heart it has um, WCD. Which is WWCD. WWCD, sorry. Like, what would Cal do? But she don't um, talk about birds for five minutes on a. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a lovely. Jo- oh, sorry, Kirsty, were you going to say something? Oh, so- oh, sorry, mate. Just quickly, I was going to say, yes, Elle made this for Jez, but I've been in a group chat with her for years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just going to say. Um, <laughs> I- also, on the topic of what would Cal do, she would never call cats weird and she would have left them on the collar. So, just mm. saying, Jess. Yeah. Oh, well. The en- <laughs> Birds are the enemies of cats. Birds are the enemies of cats. But, but I love that you've got what would Cal do under the collar because uh, my husband uh, put a... Because he's back in London. And so he put a secret parcel in my suitcase because he knew I'd be away on my birthday. And this just happened to be the... Not just the best, the only day we could do the show, which happened to be my birthday. And uh, so he said, when you open your present, I, I said, oh, I found this present in my thing. And he said, when you open it, FaceTime me. And it, um, so I FaceTimed him and it was a locket. And inside there's a picture of me on one side and Cal on the other. Um, so that's such a lovely present. Um, and a little bag for of me cocaine. To wear. That's so nice. <laughs> Can you imagine if I'd been... <laughs> I've gone through so many different airports with it and I haven't known. I've always said there's no mule like a white woman who doesn't know she's carrying. (laughs) White women are not suspected. We're not stopped and we're not suspected. And if they do find it, you just go, I don't know what it is. I've never seen it before. Uh, you know, I do think that's the whitest feminist privilege there is. God, can you imagine that? Um, I did once accidentally bring in a little bag of (laughs) to Australia. And gave it to Hannah Gadsby, and that's how she wrote in a net. So there you are. <laughs> um, white bag feminism right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There she is in the front row. She microdosed on it. Um, that's all true. Cal loved that story. She loved those... Anything naughty like that, anything where you like, I'm going to tell you something now that you can't tell anyone. I've blown it now by telling everyone. Um, <laughs> but, yeah... Um, my favourite, one of my very favourite Cal moments, and I mean, I didn't know she was ill right to the end, and they, Kirsty very kindly put a phone next to Cal so I could say goodbye, and I don't even know what I fully said. I was in so much shock. But I do remember saying, a bit like your, you know, running gag, I just, I just loved the way she could riff on stage, and I just loved the play of her. Do you know what I mean? It's not just like jokes, it's like the play. And I remember once we were talking about, we'd both turned up on stage with, you know, bright coloured glasses and statement necklaces and we were joking about, are we going into our... Is this the age we're hitting now where we're going into our statement necklace phase? <laughs> and just, Cal, she just quipped. And I asked her afterwards, have you written that joke? She said, no, no, I just, just riffed it. She just quipped, um, yes, I'm wearing a statement necklace and the statement is, don't look at my neck. <laughs> how good a joke is that? I was like, how can you... <laughs> that, that is as good as anything any human being can write. That's Shakespeare to me. <laughs> The statement is, don't look at my neck. I mean, it's just... It's so brilliant. I have to show you this message, actually, because after doing the Guilty Feminist podcast with you many years ago, and Cal was on there as well, uh, she sent me... Well, I couldn't sleep. I was completely buzzed afterwards. It was such an electric show. And she sent me this message, like, asking me how I felt. And, you know, we went back and forward. I said to her, I've got some merch ideas for the Guilty Feminist. And one is this kind of Brazilian cut pair of underpants that says, I'm a feminist but, but with two T's. Yes. I did wonder what you were showing me on stage. I thought, she's just showing me a little bit of, like, just, uh, erotica. Just, a, just an ass. I said, I thought of this at 4am and then Cal said, I was going to give Deb a hoodie with feminist down low across the back so that people could look at her feminist butt, but Lincraft didn't have all the letters. <laughs> That's Cal in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. Always in Lincraft. Always. Looking for the right letters. My group chat with Cal 
is with Carl and me and Grace Petrie and it's called Lesbian Museum because there's famously a lesbian... Well, I don't know if it's famous, but there's a lesbian museum in Auckland and Grace Petrie did not know about the lesbian museum till like, days in, and she was absolutely... She was so livid that when we were talking about on the stage, she came out onto the stage from backstage to say, why did no one tell me there was a lesbian museum? <laughs> and Grace would never do that. Grace would never come on stage if it wasn't her moment to come on stage. She stormed onto the stage. Um, and, uh, yeah, there were many long-running jokes about the lesbian museum in Auckland. Um, but I have a thing where my family don't often come to see me perform. You know, we've all got our sad stories. Um, <laughs> there's adoptions, there's cults, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's got something. If it's not a cult, it's a divorce. If it's not a divorce, it's uh, whatever you've got. And I thought someone from my family was in. And you know when you're, something's going really well and you're really happy your family's in? Because then I was just having a really good night. So I, I started off with some stand-up and it was, I was just doing crowd work and riffing with the audience. And I was having such a good night. And I was having so much fun. And I was like, so glad they're in. And then something came up that only my family member would know. So I said, oh, well, actually, so-and-so's in tonight. So I called out for her, and she'd asked me to put tickets on for her and, like, six friends, and she wasn't there. Oh. And it was so awful. I mean, it was so awful, and I was just like, oh. And then I was like, well, maybe something's happened. Like, I was trying to cover. Like, I think I knew that she just hadn't come and hadn't texted me to say put the seats on sale, and it was sold out. So it was a bit annoying. Um, <laughs> but it was more like this awful feeling of... It's hardly ever that I have family in the audience. And I was just like, it was just awful. It was just like really triggering, felt very... You know when you get triggered to some kind of childhood place or something? Anyway, the audience started shouting out, text her, text her, see where she is. And I got sort of... You know when you get kind of crowd bullied into something? <laughs> and you sort of... The peer pressure of the crowd... I just think to stop them saying that, I end up doing it. And I end up on stage live seeing a message come back saying, oh, yeah, I just, I got home from work and I was too tired. And, it, and I was, I mean, she would be really upset if she knew this had upset me. I never told her. But I was so I upset. I think she needs to know that that's upsetting. <laughs> Text her now. <laughs> If, we're, if we could just get the audience chanting, call her, call her. <laughs> My God. Geraldine, so, what would Cal do? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I don't well, know. we know what Cal would do because Cal was there, so we know what she would do. So she and I were co, co-piloting and I just had to sort of get through the show, you know, with this sort of lump in your throat and you just, I just had to pretend it was no big deal and, like, I think they started saying read the message out and I don't know if I fudged it or what I did, but I just kind of got through the show, had to interview the guest who was a real live wire and then as soon as we came off stage, and I know it sounds like, it's not that big a deal, but you know when something oh, is a big deal is. to you? And it was just a big deal to me, and it just was. And I walked off stage, and I just burst into tears, and I was just sobbing. And I was just saying, like, it's kind of, like, always this way. And Cal was just so amazing to me. Like, she was just so, like, a mother to me. Like, she hugged me. She was like a sister. She just looked after me, and she made me feel so fine about being so upset. And some people would be like, oh, what do I do now? Like, you know... I'm meant to be in charge of this show. If anyone should be being big sistering to anyone, I, I should have, you know, I, I should be me. But she just kind of swept me up and she was so good about it. And she got me out of the building because it was the building where you had to go through the bar. And normally, of course, I like to see people who've come to the show. And, you know, I'm not often in New Zealand. So, of course, I want to say hello to people if I can. But every night it would normally be lots of people who want selfies and stuff and want me to sign books. And she was like, we're not doing that tonight. And she just got me out. She found like a back way, like a spy. And she just got me out and she got me home. And she like got a bottle of wine. In. Like normally we'd sort of go to, you know, if we're doing shows on the trot, we might go to bed. We wouldn't necessarily stay up. And she was like, we're getting wine in, we're getting pizza. And she just looked after me like a sister. And it's just such a strong feminist memory to me. Like that side of, you know, that is feminism. Like that is somebody who's absolutely there for you as a sister. And I want that story to go out, so I'll just say, I had a disappointment on stage. Tom, edit this in. <laughs> One night I was on stage somewhere where we were on tour. I can't even remember where. And something happened on stage that really upset me. And I had to hold it together, and Cal knew I had to hold it together. And she really piloted the show, and she took the reins in a way that she just sort of... 
understood. And when we came off stage and I fell into her arms crying, she totally got it. She totally understood. And then, Tom, you can edit in the big, a bit about being a spy. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was right. <laughs> See, it's always worth coming out live, isn't it? It's worth coming out live. Yes. The things you find out. I, I already know you're excellent at this, but that was amazing. <laughs> and, Tom, if you want to, you can also put the bit in about heroin. <laughs> Sorry, I've been, I've been dead weight for a while and I just thought I'd pipe up and say so. But that's all I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's not being clear. Claire, Hooper. tell us about when you took care of No! Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was with Cal Wilson. Um, and I'll feel forever guilty about it. Now, nah, I just... You said, you said bring your stories about Cal... That are about feeling guilty and about being feminist. And I was like, yeah, no worries. And now that I'm here listening to the funny stories, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you just brought sad ones. It's okay. We so need I'm just sad ones too. Sad ones are good. No, they're not. Here's the, here's the thing. I've, um, I've been s- struggling with the idea of coming and talking about her here. Because I just don't think I'm ready for a public-facing chat about her. Do you know? I understand that. And, um, and also, it's like Guilty Feminist is one of my favourite podcasts and I know it's meant to be funny and joyous and hopeful. And so it's like, well, do I do that or do I be honest? Be honest, be honest. We like a gear change. Sure. <laughs> We've had many episodes where everyone's cried. Okay. I feel, um, I mean, I I said this um, at the funeral that I, the thing I always said to her was, I'll I'll work out a way to pay you back one day. And it's, I guess my guilty, um, I guess my guilty thing is just this idea that I, um, I mean, I was grateful for all the things she gave me because she, we got a lot of hand-me-downs but we got a lot of brand new gifts. I got a lot of jewellery and like kids' plates and kids' books and toys and furniture and we got, I'm pointing at Chris, we got her old silverware and um, <laughs> look, we, my household took a lot of stuff from her household and I did it. <laughs> I did it joyfully and she gave it joyfully. Um, And I really did always think that I would pay her back. Um, A few weeks before she went into hospital, we um, moved into a rental for a while and um, uh, we put everything in storage. And because I've always hated how much of a hoarder I am, I just used it for a bit of panic decluttering and... I just did bootload after bootload to the op shop and there were so many... I didn't know Cal was sick and there were so many things that had come into my household from her household that just went out again without any fanfare. And um, I just have this memory of a brooch that she gave me lying in the dust of an empty room and I can't summon up the memory of me picking it up. And I, I guess I'll find out when we get our stuff out of storage. I know I don't know if it's better if I do or I don't find it. Like all of these things that just went into storage as objects and they're going to come out so full of heat, you know? Anyway... That's my guilty thing. So, cool. Enjoy that gear change. (laughs) I know um, the way you talked about um, how and how much she gave, I always found it fascinating that you would feel guilty about not paying her back. I mean, I know you can't pay her, but, but you've... You, it's just with, well, you've paid everybody back. You, you're both, you would, 
two amazing people that were so giving and it's like I, I was like listening to you going, do you know how much stuff you've given me? <laughs> <laughs> like there's a beautiful um, necklace with a horse on it that you were wearing one day and I was like, I love that <laughs> and you just gave it to me. <laughs> there's at, – at my in-law's house there um, – We've got a beautiful um, big dog, a Bernese mountain dog that sleeps on this couch which you gave to me. <laughs> yeah. So you, you look at you go, you gave us a couch. <laughs> <laughs> which, and like my you... partner complimented you on your jacket once <laughs> and you took it off and handed it to her and now. told her she could have it. Yeah. This yeah. is a real weird jacket thing happening with my mates and my partner. Yeah. This I'm... really weird... No one's given me a jacket. No one's taken one of my jackets. Well, but... maybe start by complimenting my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> And also, <laughs> and it's not just you don't just do it for friends, do you? like? Oh no, this infuriates me actually. You're, you're too generous, Claire. What about how you gave a punter in the audience a dress to wear once? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Someone complimented her dress. She said she was having like a gold themed fiftieth, <laughs> and she was like, "Your dress is great. It'd be great for my party." And so I was like, oh, i got to change your clothes. So I, um, I went backstage and I changed and I let her take the dress home. Yes. And then it eventually yeah, she... turned up. She'd, um, she posted it back and she hadn't dry cleaned it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought I would get a free dry clean at least. But um, no, I suppose that's fair. She returned it in the condition I gave it to her. <laughs> um. I think the thing about this group chat that Cal was part of it, all these overcrossing group chats and friendship circles is I think the truth is there's a lot of paying it forward mm. and it comes around. And I think if you're lucky enough to have friends that pay it forward and pay it round and, you know, I know how Cal felt about you and she didn't want anything back. She got everything she needed from the friendship, it's never about silverware or brooches. It's really at the end of the day. They're just things that we hang on to sometimes to try and make meaning of what we've lost. But Cal got a lot from the sisterhood. She thrived on it. She loved it and she loved to give. And sometimes accepting is accepting that generosity is is a sort of gift in itself. She gave me a tiny milk jug. Like a miniature barista milk jug. Oh. We were at a shop. Can you, how, because are you, you're gesturing like two big. centimetres? Yeah, yeah, like less, less than two centimetres. Does Does it, all, not, is it for a dollhouse? You'd struggle to get the steamer in that. Yeah, absolutely. You wouldn't even get the steamer in. But we were at a cafe and they had a whole bunch of um, trinkets and I picked it up and I was like, how cute is this? And then she went and bought it so that when we left she slipped it in my handbag so that when I opened my handbag I had a miniature milk jug. <laughs> and I wore Do it you around... think she stole it? That sounds like she stole it. It was, it was in a brown paper bag so I assume okay. that she paid for it, although she was crooked. Um, <laughs> she... Um, <laughs> But she kind of this is this is fun, very funny to me on two levels. Cal loved a shitting yourself story. Loved it. And when she was in hospital, Claire told her a horrendous shitting yourself oh, story yeah. about a friend of ours. And, oh yeah. And that's she would right. have absolutely loved it. And I, I, felt, I felt like I should have spent that time telling her how great she was. But, yeah. But, but it, was, I, it was a really good story. And the reason I bring it up is because she loved the idea. I, I wore it around my neck for a couple of weeks after she died and I loved the idea that she bought it for me because I thought it was really cute but also because it was my kryptonite because I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> and she thought it would be so funny that I had this tiny milk jug that just reminded me of my IBS, like I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then I, I knew that she loved those stories and then I stood next to her holding her masculine hand as, um, <laughs> as Claire Hooper told her a story about our friend Nicolette who shat herself. <laughs> um, and then the day that she passed... Uh, Geraldine called Nicolette and had her retell the story to us um, as we sat in a park uh, on, the, on the corner of City Road and Broadway. I don't know why that's important. Um, <laughs> but the other day I drove past that park that we had all sat in and I turned my head and there was a corporate event going on and it made me really angry that there was a corporation in that park. I was just like, you don't get to be in that park. Um, and I threw my neck out. <laughs> And I messaged Hoops and I said I was having a good day and then I drove past the park that we sat in on the day that Cal died and I threw my neck out. And she just wrote, that's so sad, it's so funny. <laughs> Sorry, babe. It's all right. <laughs> um, it's about time that we need to think about winding up. So um, there's a little bit of comedy that I want to play before I bring our um, final act on. Um, that is, it's just the magic of Cal that, and this is what I'm going to miss being on stage with her, that this is some, there was just something about our rapport and her lively lightness. Oh, man, I'm going to miss it. And um, it's just really hard to think about because I toured with her so much around Australia and New Zealand and I don't think I ever did a show with anyone else in New Zealand, so it's really hard to think about going without her. So I just want to play this bit. This is a bit where something about the Wiggles came up in the most vague way and Cal started riffing on the Wiggles and it opens with... um, You're going to hear it, but it opens with Cal talking about a woman on the plane (laughs) saying to her, um, just because it comes in very quickly just so you get the context, saying to her, I'd do anything to get this latest Wiggles thing. Um, So, Yoni, could we just play that clip? I remember talking to a mum on a plane years ago and the new Wiggles DVD was about to come out. She goes, there is no limit to what I would do to get that DVD early. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah. Wow. Didn't even care which Wiggle. <laughs> I thought you meant like when parents go wild at those Christmas sales and they climb over other parents to get the last toy. I didn't think you meant like... They climbed over the Wiggles, as I think what she was inferring she would be quite happy to do. Offer a Wiggle a sexual favour. Is that what she's saying? I think that's what we all got from it, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't think the Wiggles do that. Do you think they're like Ken dolls and there's just... I, no, I don't think that, but I think more they'd sing a song about it. Do you know what I mean? I feel if I went home with a Wiggle after a big night out and, you know, everyone pairs up and you think, oh, I'll just go home with this Wiggle. <laughs> when we got to the bedroom, they'd sing a song about consent. Like... <laughs> or it would be like... the guitar. Toot, toot, big red bra, something like that. <laughs> hot potato, hot potato. I don't know the songs, but... Why, why, should we, why should we not think that the Wiggles are sexual beings? Like, <laughs> they deserve bodily autonomy? The, I don't know how we listen, got here. I never know how we got here. If there are any listening, if there are any Wiggles listening, I'm sure you are fantastic just, in bed. It just... <laughs> except for Jeff, except... Wake up, Jeff! <laughs> Um, the continued riff my favourite uh, punchline was um, to, to, you'll never guess what Murray's into <laughs> and on that note and on that note please welcome to the stage someone who's worked with the Guilty Feminist a lot has worked with Cal a lot and has never ever closed a Guilty Feminist show without making us all cry put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Ali McGregor <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so Deb played me that clip or, or you know, that episode and, um, and thought it might be nice to represent that little bit in song. Um, so I've, I've brought with me, uh, please give me a round of applause for Beck Matthews on drums. <laughs> and Vicky Falconer on violin. And so where I've gone with it, I don't, I don't write songs and I'm not funny but I do like to sing other people's songs and so I've taken that idea um, and thought I mean Deb you said that um, you know if if you took a wiggle home they'd probably write a song and I thought well 
I think that might have already happened because there's one particular song of the Wiggles that I'm pretty sure was written about an orgy. Um, now, I've never been... I'm a feminist, but I've never been in an orgy. Um, but I'm assuming that it's like, you know, any party where there's kind of everyone has their, their roles to play, if you will, and... You know, any party I've gone to, there's always someone out the back playing guitar and, and always someone asleep. So um, we're going to play this song, give it a little bit of a sexy twist. Um, this is about an orgy that the Wiggles had that they like to call <laughs> their big red car. <laughs> Fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knew where to look. <laughs> I made eye contact with everybody. <laughs> I just realised I'm wearing a big red bra as well, so that's all good. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna finish the show with a, a song that was really special to Cal. Um, Cal and my husband, Adam, shared a very uh, deep love of comedy but also of a band called Elbow. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with Elbow in here. Um, Elbow's one of those bands that when you love them, you really freaking love them. And uh, Adam and, and Chris and Cal went to a bunch of concerts and Adam was really impressed because Cal would casually go, oh, yeah, I'm mates with Craig the keyboardist and I think they met on Twitter I think and got friendly and and uh, and so this song when I mentioned that Deb had asked me I, I spoke to Adam and I said you know what should I sing and he said you've got to sing this song and it has it's a sort of a hymn like song when Elbow first uh, put it on their album the, the, the end of the song there's a big kind of sing-along aspect and they they recorded uh, that for their album at Glastonbury and uh 
So tonight I'm going to get you, because this is, you know, uh, better than Glastonbury in my opinion, so I, I'm going to get you guys to, uh, to, to sing the end of the song. Now, I, I don't know what Guy Garvey wrote this song about. Um, for me, it, it's, uh, I've had a, you know, I think we've all had a big year. It's been, uh, we're getting to that age where shit's happening, shit's getting real, and we look for hope in any way we can. And this, for me, is a kind of song uh, to the universe um, and it's, it is a song about hope, I think. Um, and the last sing-along that I want you all to sing along with me, if you can, at the end. Um, wait for my call. Don't fuck me up in the middle of it. But um, uh, the, what you're going to sing is a message to the universe, and that is, we still believe in love, so fuck you. So if you can all get on board at the end, that would be really lovely.
Thanks for Claire Hooper, <laughs> Susie Youssef, <laughs> Kirsty Wiebeck, <laughs> Geraldine Hickey, <laughs> Dallas Fresca, <laughs> and Ali McGregor and her band. <laughs> Everyone here at the Wheeler Centre. Um, and we send all our love to her family here in the audience tonight and everybody who considered uh, Cal family or an important person. And, friend or somebody they just if you just loved her work thank you so much for coming and being with us I know she would have really loved tonight <laughs> and somewhere wherever she is I, I feel like she does thank you so so much for coming um, it's been really wonderful we'll be back Guilt of it must be back in May and um, we'll try and make it work with Cal we'll do the best that we can worst case scenario we have the peg <laughs> please Leave your memories on our Christmas tree at the back. Thank you so much. I've been Deborah Francis White. We've been the guilty feminists. This has been for Cal. Good night. Obviously, that will not go out in the podcast, um, but <laughs> something else that probably... I'll try and do a version of it so that we can cut out the relevant bit. Um, we were in New Zealand, and... Um, <laughs> this is, no, this is... Doing heroin. <laughs> when I said the guilty feminist would be back in May, I did mean that our next Australia and New Zealand tour will be in May. Watch out for tickets going on sale soon. In the meantime, there'll be more Guilty Feminist in the UK. Thank you. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.